Welcome to the Sultans of Spine podcast. I'm your host, Jamil Pendleton. I go by Jay. And this is a podcast that is designed to take a look inside the med tech industry, specifically medical device. I happen to work in the spine and robotics space, and our guest, Melanie Thomas, works in sports medicine. And so interested about that space, interested about Melanie and what she's got going on. It's a very interesting person. I actually met in Austin about four years ago. So I, without further ado, Mel, I'll just have you introduce yourself. And again, this is, uh, I've been a guest on two podcasts and I figured I think it's time to start my own. And so I don't really have a, a set format. This is just going to be a conversation between us and um, a few questions here and there that I, that I have jotted down, but really just want to hear from you and hear about you. And um, without further ado, Melanie Thomas. No, yeah, no, thanks for having me. And I love everything that you've already been pouring out because like you said, we met four years ago and at the time I was an Orange Theory coach, which is so unrelated to the medical sales field in any capacity. But you would like come in like this animal of a person and you always hassled me about not having like the 80 pound dumbbells because you needed <laughs> heavier weights. And I'm like this small little coach that didn't know what was going on. And you like drove a nice car and you just like, just looked good. And you just like, I don't know, it was like your vibe. And I was just like always so intrigued by like what you were doing. And I, I think that it was so much of the reason that I had that initial interest in the field because of like your vibe entirely wow. like from working out no kidding that's amazing yes. oh that's my good. yes yes because i had to go to our like ceo to try and get you freaking dumbbells and i'm like the fact that this random dude has somehow convinced me to approach the ceo of orange theory about 80 pound dumbbells i'm like he must be killing it in sales because like why am I doing Why do I care? I didn't even why know I, I care? cared, but I did. You made me care. Well, well, kid, I don't even, well, so I do remember that, but I, the fact that you went and got, I don't know if I knew that story. That's amazing. Yeah. So let me just, let me just take a step back. My wife and I started doing Orange Theory and you were our favorite coach. Like, like there's a lot of great coaches like Big Sean and Autumn, but you, I mean, you, you were doing so great. Uh, and, and you, you made me laugh. You, you have a really uh, funny way of, self-deprecating humor, which I, I try to do that as well. You yes. also really kind of care. You can tell people you cared about the clients in there. And I saw a few little things in just personality traits, whatever it was. Uh, and Orange Theory didn't work for me. This is nothing against Orange Theory. I'm much more uh, kettlebell kind of kind of <laughs> weightlifting guy. Yes. But I wanted to do something with my wife. You know, we had never worked out together. And it was really cool to take the class, um, you know, just trying something different. Uh, and, and I think I... It was right after I stopped uh, doing CrossFit is when is when I when I started working. But anyway, not about me. What I saw in you, and then later I think we had a uh, a conversation about med sales, right? Is that kind yeah? Of how? And 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 we went to breakfast. Yeah. I yeah, remember, yeah. Here, go ahead. No, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I I think I remember like asking you like, what do you do? What do you and your wife do? You just look so successful. I'm like, what? And then you kept saying med sales, and I'm like. <laughs> say oh, I could do that so. right what is that well uh first off looks can be deceiving um but I appreciate that and it's really actually cool to me I honestly didn't know that before that, that I had some influence in in your path because I was going to ask you what made you want to get into medical device sales as some bald dude some dad bod guy trying to trying to you know lift weights um but when we went to breakfast, there was something that I saw in you, or a couple things that I saw in you. I think you sold Cutco. Was that correct? Growing up? Like, yes, I was like 16 at the time, and I got into Cutco knife sales, and I Amazing. killed it. Like, I freaking killed that job. My mom was like, dude, she's like pulling in money. Like, she was like stashing some. I'm like, you just you had that grip early on, and you had that mentality of like, when you do this, you get this. And so that's yeah. what it was. It was just a, the knack for the business. And so people come to me all the time and ask, how do I break into this industry? And, and first off, and I'm going to repeat this joke. It's not even that funny. It's a dad joke. It's not a robbery. It's not like you don't have to break in. It, yes, it's difficult, yeah. but it's doable. I got in, you got in, neither of us had any sort of medical sales experience, but what's the common denominator between you and I, besides our, our hairstyle. 
<laughs> oh yeah, it's hustle all the way, all day hustle. long. Med sales is hustle. Yeah, and and, and just grit, and, and there's a lot of words for it: hustle, grit, grind, discipline. And I think that there's a correlation between fitness and this space. You know, particularly like I was at in Memphis for uh, meetings this week, our leadership meetings uh, uh, for our, our company. We just met, met trying to turn over a fiscal calendar on May one, and. Our vice president and general manager of the spine business was in the Peabody gym in Memphis with me two new mornings in a row, 6 a.m. as soon as they opened. And uh, everybody knew him right in the place because he's in the process of moving in, uh, his family from Minneapolis to Memphis with this new role. And he trains. And I don't think that that's, it's not, it's just something that I see as a common thread in highly successful people. This isn't yeah. about working out at all, but yeah. he's got something that he's super passionate about and he, yeah. he's consistent with it. So yeah. what are your thoughts no, on that coming from the fitness world? Like, I mean, take us back through your, your, your uh, stage days, if you don't, I mean, just kind of yeah. that whole yeah, I, I know. I've really been kind of all over the place and I work you know, with striker sports medicine division specifically. And we always get jokes about how like everyone that works as striker, like comes from an elite sport in some capacity. So I'm like, okay, I kind of feel like I fell into the right place for myself, but yeah, I did acrobatics and tumbling in college, which crossed between gymnastics and cheerleading. I had kind of gotten scouted out for it and it was by far the hardest thing I've probably ever done. It was the most intense training I've ever done, but it kind of got me into the world of fitness. And as, yeah, I started doing NPC bikini shows. And of course with that, you're getting a lot of like the weight fluctuations. So mm -hmm. for me in my head, I'm like, okay, I need to be consistent with my training and, you know, start working out maybe a little more cardio than I was doing. And that's where I found OTF. So I kind of had gone through a progression of fitness stuff and Meanwhile, I was getting my degree in business and I kind of didn't know what I wanted to pursue so much, you know, as a future endeavor, but I know that I loved training. I know that I loved the intensity of the sport. Um, I love, yeah. I just loved the whole fitness thing in general and, but I need more money because there is a cap in income with yep. the fitness industry and I knew it and I needed a way out. So was money your reason to transition into, into this work in this space? I don't think it was my reason, to, definitely not my reason for getting into med sales. I think when I was seeking other opportunities coming out of the fitness space, I wanted something where I had more control of my commission or my income because I knew that I was going to be a hard worker and I knew that I was going to put in the time and the effort and I didn't want my pay to be a reflection of anything but that effort that I was giving. So well said. yeah, I just, I, I felt like I would have a problem like being that person on the team that was like working more hours or studying longer or thinking more strategically and then getting the same income. I'm like going and getting like, like 70 pound, 80 pound dumbbells for your favorite. Uh, we go above and beyond here. You know, but, but that's really interesting. When you peel that back, like several layers, the psyche of a 16 year old girl who really loved Putco and, and, that is terrifying for some people, the door to door sales or whatever, you know, however you work that through with your community in the neighborhood in um, Orange County. Is that where you grew up? Yeah. So in that, you, when you peel that back about like, okay, this is something that, that you totally get and not only get, you thrive on having a comp plan that's measured by your progress and performance and yeah. all the little things, all the research, like the books that, that I'm reading now to be better at this job. And I'm 13 years in and I'm still trying to improve every single day. You're the same, sounds like the same way. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm hard, we're hard on ourselves. This type of person, I think we, we're hard on ourselves. Always want to be better, always like, researching more, working like anything I can. I like am in therapy and I want to learn more about relationships. And I also want to like do crush it with my job. But it's, it's like, you just have a lot of tenacity for life, I think. And that's really what differentiates a good med sales rep is that tenacity. I love it. I think, I think you're spot on. Okay. So let, let, a couple of those questions. And I, I, I sent you these ahead of time, but um, 
I'd like to dive into your routine. Like, like I like to know people's, and I always ask this question, and it's a really good question. So what is your routine maybe on a surgery day versus like a day where you're doing a bunch of calls or, you know, even week, you know, weekends, kind of what, what let, let's learn more about Mel. Yeah. Um, so, well, me and my partner kind of joke because we both got brought into med sales in 2020, which was a huge COVID year. And so we both kind of had this alternate reality scope lens on what being in med sales was like, because we came in and we kind of did our initial training and onboarding. And then it was like, well, the world's in lockdown and we couldn't go to cases with our reps. You know, we were, we weren't welcome in because they didn't know us. And, um, it kind of created this really weird perspective of like what medical sales was. And so I think as COVID has kind of come to an end and I've transitioned territories, the day-to-day -day looks a lot different than what it did last year. Um, but typically like if I can work out in the morning, I do. I probably, if I have a later surgery start, then I'll go and work out in the morning. And later surgery start would be like, sometimes cases will start at like eight to 10 and I can get like a 5 a.m. in. I am typically up no later than six, like every morning. That's, that's kind of like the alarm clock though, whether I work out or not. Um, if, if I sleep in past six, like I'm going to struggle and I know that about myself. So it's just consistency there. Do you use an alarm clock or is it body clock at this stage? Yeah, okay. I do use an alarm clock and probably like to, when I was coaching at OTF, our alarms go off at 345 for the 5am mm -hmm. shift. Cause you have to be there at 4 30. And in some cases I was driving far and I used to snooze that alarm like 10 times and run yeah. late. And in 2020, I told myself, like, I think I read a study and it said, like, if you get up on that first alarm, like the rest of your day can like increase in productivity by like 10%. So yes. now I've like trained myself, like that first alarm goes off and I like count to three and I'm up out of bed and with enough repetition, like I, I can, I honestly, I'll pat myself on the back for that one. Like That's first good. alarm, I'm out of bed. I'm a habitual snoozer and I'm, 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 I'm you know, I've definitely had a well, recovering habitual snoozer. I'm trying to get yeah. better. Recently, I have a body clock, which just wakes me up like at 515 because oh, yeah. my, I'm used to training in the mornings as well, like yeah. you said. And there's tons of studies out there. There's tons of people out there that talk about when you do something very difficult at the, at the beginning of your day. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you, if, if you saw, but during December, I did pajama pull-ups every morning I get up yeah. and do some pull-ups right yeah. or whatever it is whatever that thing is I don't always have time for a full workout but I still do something and I think that that just sets the day sets the tone I think it's similarly to the Navy SEAL uh general I believe mentality of make your bed uh yeah. you know just do a task and complete something every day and I think for people like us it just just sets the tone for intentionally yeah. living and, and, and I don't know, I, I think that that's something, there's something to that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the alarm clock thing, I, yeah, it, it, my body does wake me up, but I, I'm so paranoid as it is. Like I still set six alarm clocks and I'll, I'll still wake up on the first one. Like I just, I can't, I hate being late a time thing. It's, it's big to me. So I'm up. But yeah, we run cases like cases typically start at 730. Um, I have a really small territory, so driving's not too bad. Um, we'll get to the facility at seven. I take like about 30, 40 minutes to get ready in the morning and then I'm out the door. I fast until lunch every day. So I just do coffee until about like noon or one, um, depending on how many cases we're running. You know, like sometimes it's two, sometimes it's five. We'll bounce between accounts. And then yeah. you have like a home base office in San Diego hit that up if I need to pick up any equipment or right. you know, instrumentation for the next day and then go home. And if I didn't work out in the morning, work out and then eat in bed, bed by like nine 30 at the latest. Yeah. I, it's very, it's eerily similar to me. I mean, I, I fast as well. Um, it's something that I think just works for me. Yeah. It's funny. I read some funny quote, like millennials biggest achievement is that the uh, like, lazily or some something about the fact that they're skipping breakfast and now that's a fad called intermittent fasting but i actually think that it it, it does wonders uh you know yes. for me and recently took a business trip and just decided to experiment with a 24 hour fast so oh yeah sunday evening we finished eating at like 6 30 and i didn't eat again until dinner on monday and uh interesting not not, not sure about that i think i yeah, that's a bit of time I, much prefer the the warrior right the 19.5 is kind of my yeah. 
my favorite 19 hours of fast and five of feeding. So, yeah. um, okay. Well, I love to hear about your routine. What, I guess we're, we, we, we got a couple different ways we can go from here. Cause I do want to talk about you being a young female in a male dominated industry, as well as what's one thing you wish you had known, like when you first started and I, I, you're, you're still relatively young in, in, ter in terms of your, of your experience in the field, but maybe there's something that you wish you would have started doing differently that you're doing now. Yeah. Um, I think, so I just, for background, I started in January of 2020. So now I'm almost about like that year and a half mark in, I was an associate for year one and then promoted into that reps role for year two. So that's kind of how my trajectory has been. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Um, as far as something I wish I knew, maybe, I mean, there's so many things you could say you wish you knew, right? But I think the one thing that maybe surprised me was how much you're alone as a med sales rep. In my head, I thought, oh, like I'm going to be with all these people and I'm a very social person. And it's not that I have a hard time speaking to strangers, but you are really like on your own in this big, big world. You are walking into facilities alone. You're dropping trays alone. You're in the operating room alone. It is a lot of you time, even just right. waiting for surgeries to start. Like you're sitting in the hospital cafeteria for sometimes two hours before a case will kick off. And it's a lot more of an alone field than I yeah. thought. You know, that's so, it's so fascinating that you bring that up because you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I, when I started, I was observing a, a very busy and senior rep and just shadowed him everywhere he went. So it was just the two of us, but yeah, he didn't have anybody else hanging with him. And like the amount of time that we log in the spine industry, and maybe, maybe somewhat as, as, as well as yours, just putting in, instrumentation together in a dungeon of a basement. I mean, <laughs> hours a day to do that. And, you know, that's why I think it's just, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. Yeah. It, but, but you know how it is. You, you make fast friends, I'm sure, as I do with SPD, with, with the loading dock folks. And it's like this routine of you walk in and, you know, just spreading light along the way. And, yeah. And you, yeah. You, know. you find your way. And I always try and think, I'm like, you know, people want to work with people who they want to be around. So like okay. if I'm walking in as a med sales rep and I'm like Debbie Downer, I didn't sleep and I'm so tired and like, no, I'm not going to go get you that because like, I'm too lazy. Like that energy, I just like believe people sense the energy that you bring into each room you walk into. And whether I'm like the smartest or the dumbest or like the rep that they like or don't like, whatever it is, I just want them to sense a good energy with me. So they want me to come back into their operating room. So I feel like that's always what I try and bring in is just like excited energy, whether I know people or not. And so far, I feel well, like that's worked out. <laughs> that's next level stuff, Mel, because I do the same thing. In fact, I got some advice from my boss uh, after pre presenting to all of our vice presidents and some executives in the room and um, as well as some other people. And they're just like, I love the energy that you bring, the passion. And I'm still doing exactly what you're doing now, starting out a year plus in. I still feel that I'm, I'm riding on that energy. Right. I'm not always going to have the answers and I'm not always going to know what yeah. to do. But one thing I can control is how I show up and how I prepare. And yeah. I think that that's a, another thing that is going to lead to your success. And it already has. You've got a promotion a year in. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So let's talk about that other subject. Oh, God. Being a female in med Being sales. Being a female in med sales. It's, it's, a, it's a real thing. And I have colleagues that are near and dear to me that they, we actually had a women in leadership forum where they, where they talked about this subject and on a panel, but what, what have you discovered? What just kind of walk us through that yeah. space. And this is going to be interesting because I know I'm a male. It, <laughs> it is an interesting topic. And like, I think so like, I mean, truly, it, like just very frank, I am the only female in sports medicine in my division right now, my, my region, um, wow. not my division, my region. So our region is called desert coast and it is Arizona, Nevada, and then San Diego, small region. I mean, maybe like, you know, 30 something reps, but I'm the only girl. Wow. So like that in itself to me is like, how is that even possible that out of 30 mm -hmm. hires, they only have one female and it's, you know, they are actively hiring and, you know, working on bringing new people. And we did just split 
you know, our territories up. And so there's a million reasons that could be the case, but I find it so interesting. Like one, I'm like, wow, I feel blessed to even have the opportunity to be in this position, you know, where I'm at, because clearly, I mean, it must be hard to get as a female, but um, it is surprising to me. I also think the division I'm in, which is sports medicine, I think of like sports medicine surgeons as like the cool, like surgeon group, like yeah. the yeah. ortho surgeons are the- like, they're just like a little more like cool guy, like either like the frat surgeons or like the sports team surgeons. And totally. Yeah, they're like bros and they want to hang out with the guys and they want to get beers with the guys. So as a female rep, you know, right. you're, you kind of have to play your cards right. And I feel like for me, there's been a couple situations where I'm like, okay, you know, I go up to a surgeon after the case, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, hey, you know, Dr. So-and-so, love the case. Thanks so much for, you know, whatever we did today. Would you want to grab a beer after work? And they're like, do I want to grab a beer with like just you, like just me and you and like the one, like just you as a female rep. And sure, maybe like some of my surgeons who like are homies with me would kind of be like, sure, like we can hang out, but I would probably invite my coworker who's a guy. Yep. Or I'd be like, hey, like, why don't I take you to a steak dinner and we can talk business proposals? Like, there's like this different Dynamic. level of yep. comfort associated with that when it's an older gentleman, man, surgeon, and a young 27 year old female. It's sometimes I worry about like what their wife would think. I've actually had um, one of my other friends who is a rep female tell me, yeah, this surgeon wouldn't work with me because his wife told him he didn't want a female rep traveling with him, you know, going to conferences with him, going to dinners with him. So he stays away from female reps. And I've had other female reps, you know, somewhere else be like, yeah, I've been inappropriately cornered. I have been inappropriately contacted, inappropriately approached in elevators Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it happens and you have to be aware of your surroundings and, you know, be smart, but it's sad that that's still something that's actively happening in a professional industry. Um, I do think you have to play your cards a little bit differently, but like even yesterday, I have a meeting coming up next week with a surgeon and, you know, some of the advice I was given was, okay, so when you go in, you know, just, just doll yourself up a little more than like you would on a regular work day. Just like doll yourself up a little more. Cause like he likes, he he really likes to work with like certain types of reps and like, you know, turn on the charm just turn on the charm and you know Mm -hmm. like I think that's really gonna bode well for you and I'm like when in God's green earth have you as a man ever been told like just like doll yourself up a little turn on the charm for that one probably never never Never. so right like and it just doesn't happen and it's because it's like you guys can go grab a beer and it's not weird and you guys can meet up after a case and go grab lunch and it's just two guys grabbing lunch or golfing or going to take them to sports events like the dynamics as a female in the medical rep space working with primarily male surgeons is really challenging like i wouldn't take a guy to a football game just me and him i wouldn't take a guy to a steak dinner just me and him like or 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 to a traveling like like so you're you're 100 right uh i've worked this is so this is so fascinating to me on the other side of, of just seeing all the different dynamics that you just laid out. And first off, kudos to you for recognizing that quickly in your career, because it's only going to benefit you to know, kind of to have your watch outs and your spidey sense about what's going on. But that is absolutely it. You nailed it. I had a surgeon that uh, we finished up a case. I had two rooms running and his room finished before the other surgeon's room. And it was evening time and we were meeting we had some engineers and product managers in town and we were meeting at dinner and the engineer and the product manager both happened to be females both with blonde hair not that that matters it's just a detail and uh that that i'll come back to uh and the surgeon was meeting us the four of us were having a dinner to talk about and i remember when i came into that dinner that surgeon was there, the engineer and the product manager were there, and I, w- I was late. And he stared at me and later come to find out was so mad at me. This was five years ago. He still brings it up today oh God. because it's a small town, you know, suburb town. And he, 
he's a big member of the community of the church. His wife does not have blonde hair and that's just exposure that he doesn't want or need. Right. And I, and, and I, I didn't even think about it again. It didn't even occur to me the optics of being late to that dinner. And to your yeah. point, I've taken numerous surgeons on work trips where we're staying in hotels and we're going out to dinner and we're, we're in San Diego, New York, Memphis, Florida, Vegas, you name it. Never has that once been ever an issue. I took one female surgeon to New York. She brought her husband. Which was great. Fun. Yeah, it was great. But like, that's the element. And I think What's really interesting, and, and one of my colleagues, I can't wait to get her on this uh, show, this podcast, because she's got a really interesting angle of it. She uh, actively, because it, it, it is what it is, she's a female in this space, she actively creates a relationship with that surgeon's wife. Oh, yeah. I remember her telling me that, like, because she goes, look, I get it. Like, I wouldn't want my man going to dinner with it. So she just disarms it. And essentially creates that relationship with the wife right. to where the surgeon can feel comfortable going to those dinners. Because as you know, Mel, dinners and some of these meetings off site are where things can happen, right? All above right. board, all with Adam of Adam of Adam of guidelines, right? I mean, it's okay to take a surgeon to dinner. It's not inducement when we're talking about a certain product that's part of medical sales, right? The sales element, right? Right. And a lot of, with, with, with the way I'm sure you're dealing with things in ORs that I also dealt with is you can't really sell in ORs anymore with credentialing and the, and the hall monitors, so to speak, right. um, in today's ORs. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely a dynamic that, I mean, you have to think about a little more detailed than I think most men. And it does limit some of the opportunities I think that you have, and you do have to work through more, I think uncomfortable scenarios or those dialogues like I, I called you last week and I'm like how do I just like approach like this man who's just like sitting here like I don't yeah. like as a small young thing I feel like I walk in and sometimes it's like you're immediately written off you're not smart you don't know what you're going to talk about they don't believe what you're going to say and so you do you have to hold yourself like you have to be extra confident you have to be extra loud like I find myself speaking up like more vocally present which i mean i have a coaching voice yes I'm loud in general it works right. for me but you know i've i've heard some other female reps and they seem quiet and timid and yeah everyone's wearing the same stuff it's not like you look any different when you're in the or but i mean you really you've got to carry like a certain presence about yourself as a female Absolutely. And you got to know like you know when you have a moment with that surgeon if it's an, an appropriate moment like you got to take advantage of that time because might not get that again whereas right. i think men have more of those opportunities more frequently access is i mean what you just said opportunities that we have i mean like i, I can't tell you how many uh really good conversations that were had in the men's room of the hospital right because i'm coming in i'm changing the surgeon's changing i'm not like with him but like i'm yes. on the other side and it's yes. like we're just having a it, you know, one thing that I learned, and I told you this, the walk and talk, right? Yes. This is a tip for anyone listening and trying to improve their game. The walk and talk is the best thing you, the, the best thing since sliced bread. Surgeons are very busy, right? They are stacked between seeing patients in clinic, operating, administrative work, family, right? We've talked about, I've talked about this in one of my videos, but you got to find pockets in their space and you have to kind of adhere to their schedule and sometimes when you show up to clinic that's not a great place because they have a set number of patients that they got to get through and you don't want to delay their day and their staff's day but what i found is the walk and talk and basically knowing where they park it sounds a little stalkerish it is knowing where they park where they enter the facility where they when they eat like their habits so that you can be in the same place in that shared environment right. it, it, and literally say, hey, doc, do you mind if I walk with you to clinic? Sometimes that's a 20 minute walk. Yeah. When are you going to yeah. get 15 to 20 minutes with a surgeon with, without scheduling it? Right? right, right. You're totally right, too. Because like, I mean, sometimes those like, you know, I'm going to show up in the clinic or I'm going to just like sit outside the scrub sink. You're like, it's so hard now. Like, 
right with COVID and all the rules and you're right hall monitors like you don't really get that scrub sink pitch anymore and if you do I mean it's it's a minute it's not it's not the length of a walk so nope. yeah take advantage it's, of that time that's a good tip people. honestly what's that that's a great tip. Like I've thought it's, about that since you shared that with me. I'm like, I got to start being a more it's, 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 it's interesting because it's, it's a little presumptuous, right? If they don't know you. And so you have to be careful and, and calculated about how you, how you go about that. I actually would just say, Hey, I know you're busy. Do you mind if I walk with you? Right. They can say no. Yeah. Or, or they can say yes. And then you get that time. Right. So, right. um, all right. Well, so we're, we're how are we on time? Are we you okay? Yeah, I think we're doing good so okay. far. So, all right, we'll, we'll go here. Where, what, what advice would you give someone trying to get into this industry? Because I get I get a lot of that. Uh, I think it's it's understandable with the content that I've been putting out. But what, but I don't always have a great answer for people that that don't have sales experience or you know that don't have experience in this space. And and you know just to clarify the the people that I'm looking to bring into the role are, are experienced spinal robotics reps. Right. Right? So experienced uh, in, in this specific niche industry. So to you, from your point, who just recently got in last January, what do you say to these folks that want to do what you do? Yeah, you know, it's so funny now that I'm, I have you know, Striker Sports Medicine on my LinkedIn. I have people commenting or sending me messages like, Hey, can you refer me or like, Hey, remember we were at connection back in 2002 and I went to your elementary school. I'm like, I really want to work at striker. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I get what you're saying, but yeah. I'm like, there's a lot to know about the industry. I think like the first step is talking to people who are in the industry or familiar with the industry and getting a sense yeah. for what it's, what it really is. Um, which I did with you. And then you set me up with, I think one of your partners. And then I sat down with him as well. And after kind of hearing more about it and chatting about it and realizing for myself, it's what I would want to pursue kind of understanding what it would take to get in. And I think one of the feedback I got, so I had applied for striker in Austin, Texas for the orthopedics division. Right. I don't know if you knew that um, after I had met with you and I got the personality assessment, passed it. I did four interviews with them and I pretty much was told like, Hey, you got the gig, you're an associate, you're good to go. And I'm going on vacation and I'll call you in two weeks. We'll schedule you to start working ghosted, like literally never contact again. Don't know what happened. Don't know who the hiring manager is. I have told my regional manager now about him. And he was like shocked that that happened. But in the interview process, like I knew that I had some of what they were looking for. Right. Clearly not all of it, or they would have pursued it harder. And I just started to realize like, okay, they need someone that has sales experience. So if you don't have what we're looking for in the industry, go get it. Like take a step back to take a step forward that I, I did it. I left orange theory. I was making good money at OTF and yep. I took a step back and I got into real estate sales. It was an easier job to get into. I started selling houses which are a high ticket item and i did that for about eight months and reapplied to striker and then i had good sales experience on my resume love that. God, i love that okay so people if you're listening i don't know who the audience is going to end up being for the sultans of spine podcast right but if you're listening to this and you're looking to break in what you just said that's it you got to, to sales experiences it's not just the experience it's all the things that you learn and sometimes, I don't want to say a weeding out process, but sometimes sales isn't for everyone. Right. Okay? And so it's too much of a risk for a med tech, comp med tech company right. to, to give you a sales job right out of the gate without yeah. knowing that you can do a sales job. I spent totally. six years in B2B sales before I even discovered this industry and tried to get in. And yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why I was able to, to land the job, you know, with Medtronic starting right. out and, and you with Stryker starting out because you have the personality. I recognize that yeah. right? game recognized game, right? I saw you and I, I still see you and I see what you're doing. And then once you have your sales experience on your belt, like you said, eight bucks, it wasn't yeah. like you had to go do that for three years. You know, no. I talked to you. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, I think people have a really hard, like, I mean, now in, to society and the era that we're in, people want that instant gratification and they think like, I'm gonna do this and I wanna be in this right now. And so much, there's so much reward in working for something as well. And if people just yes. 
realize like take a step back to take a step forward don't be afraid of the pay cut if if it means a pay cut to get you further in the long run like I was living on scraps in LA last year, but I knew like, I knew an associate's role wasn't going to pay me a lot, but I knew I wanted med sales. And so I'm like, we are taking the hit boys. This year is not our financial year, but next year will be. And the year after that will be even more. So like be okay with taking the time to get to where you want to be and like have that path, but know what it takes. So many people are just like, oh, just I'll figure it out. It'll be handed to me. It's like, no, you got a goal. You know oh. where you want to be. Like, what's the plan to get there? Right. And that is, that's it. Like the, that's the, the realization that there are many things that you need to do before you're starting to ultimately be successful. And guess what? Once you're successful, it's not like you can stop doing those things that got right. you into this place. Right. And right. So again, just that's so wonderful to hear you were raised right or wherever you're channeling that is great. And, and I, if I may, yeah, I notice your cross. Oh yeah. And I, I'm a believer as well. And it's, it's a big part of who I am. And I'm a firm believer that, that, that we're all here for a specific purpose. There is a specific plan for you, for me, for anyone watching this, but in today's cancel culture, there's not a lot of vocal Christians uh, totally. in, in, in sales who are, who are uber competitive. You're competitive, I'm competitive. Like I'm very competitive, but I'm, it's an interesting di- dynamic there. Talk to me about your walk with, with God and kind of how, how that is uh, playing out today in, 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 in a space, a cutthroat space like medical sales. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think everyone's walk with God is so different and you learn things when you need, like you learn things at the right time. I think more than ever now I'm coming into like the terms of like God's timing is perfect timing. And if I'm doing everything I can, then like God's timing is perfect timing. So I feel like I'm a believer in just like preparing a huge part of our job is preparing, right? Prepare for the case, study the anatomy, know what you're talking about. Like, don't go in there like an idiot. You're going to look like an idiot. Um, so prepare. And if you feel like you've prepared to hundred percent of your ability and like you miss the mark, you miss the quota, you miss like the sales opportunity, you miss the meeting in whatever capacity that means like, that's okay. God's timing is the right timing and know that it's going to be all right. Um, I think that's like a huge thing I like carry with myself. I think as far as like representing Christianity, I mean, I wear this cross every day. It doesn't matter what OR I'm in. It doesn't matter where I'm at, I think more of being a Christian in the space is about like reflecting um, like Jesus through your actions. And I, I, that does not mean I am perfect because there are times I swear, there are times I bad mouth when I know I shouldn't. There are times Absolutely. where I, I don't walk the walk I should, but I think I always try and get brought back to that. And I always want, like I said at the beginning, like I always wanna be a light when I'm walking into any facility. I want people to wanna be around me I know that there is always going to be someone better than me and someone worse than me. So I got to be more unique than I'm just smart. Okay. Well, someone's smarter than you. If you think you're just smart, there is someone smarter than you, you know? So don't just be the smart guy and don't just be like the salesy, like Rico Suave guy, like encompass all of it, you know, prepare for what you can and like be the person that people want to be around. Like ask them questions about themselves. Don't focus on you. Um, and I think that's really like when you're that light, I think people see God reflected in you. And, um, I think that's like the best thing that I can do, you know, for me right now, because I fail a lot and God's timing is the right timing. I got leaving it up to God, as long as I'm doing what I can. (laughs) That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I, 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 I align with everything you just said and to take it a step further. I lost my job three months ago, right? People are seeing this, this, this resurgence and this just, just unwavering focus on growth and on being better and putting out content. And while I rebounded with a great job, a promotion, and I'm super excited about where I am. Where do you think that, how do you think that happened in just three months? Right. It, it, it absolutely down on my knees was praying about this. Yeah. It was a big dark. It was a dark day for me to basically they when they restructured and eliminated my position. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it was fuel. 
I use yeah. that as, okay, right? Water in the face, talk it up, right? Get back up, get back up off the ground and right. go do something. Go yeah. be valuable. And, you know, when one door closes, another one opens. That's just how totally. it is. Yeah. And, and God provides. And yeah. so yes. that's, that's, it's, it's, it's so, it's so awesome to hear that there are other people who feel the same way, right? Yeah. Like you out there in the trenches, working hard, but you're spreading light. And that's exactly how I built my territory. I should say my territory was built as a byproduct of just being kind and serving others. That's yeah. absolutely it. And, and I said that in a video that, that a lot of people resonated with, which, which is awesome because it, there's no secret. This isn't a, we're not con artists here. We're right. people who work hard, who know right. our products, who know our customers, and who wants to ultimately serve others so that the patient on the table gets the best possible outcome. That's why we're here. Right. Yeah. And I think so much of the, like so many people in sales in general have such a like perfectionist mentality when something goes wrong. I mean, I I've seen it in my team, like something falls through, you get like that one little bite at like a, a deal. that's just going to be that like game changer. And then it falls through and they're so hard and so down. And I look at the rest of their week and I'm like, what did you accomplish the rest of your week now that that fell through? Because you have just been sulking in like misery over this one deal. And like, if you had that perspective and that outlook of like, it's in God's timing, it's God's control. I've prayed about this. And like, I know he's got me at the end of the day, like, you know, what's going to happen the rest of the four days of the week is like, you're going to be a bigger light. You're going to know that you can overcome whatever you need to. And ultimately like that light that you're bringing to other people is going to bring you more opportunity. So like, yeah. You have to be okay and like roll with those punches. And I think the, the med sales reps that struggle the most are the ones that can't let go of the failures and right. so let it eat them alive. And I think, you know, I think you just have that outlook. Like you're going to go further in this, you know? A absolutely. There, I mean, that's just, that's just beautiful. And there, there, there was a post I saw on LinkedIn from this uh, B2B sales guy, or maybe uh, sauce. I'm not sure, but, but he, he referenced Seinfeld when, when his girlfriend wanted to break up with him. He's like, yeah, okay. I mean, somebody else. And that was just like the mentality of Jerry, like, trouble. I think that was the even Steven, uh, if you're familiar with the sign goes, you know, loses $20, yeah. finds $20 in his jacket. Yeah. Everything works out. And it's, it's so amazing that, that like, that is the mentality of just, whether it's Wayne Gretzky, you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Right. Yeah. Somewhat related. I love that quote. Right. Michael Scott also claims it, which is also <laughs> makes it a great quote. Also and, great uh he's he's amazing but that that just mentality i mean this is a like a lot of things you've been in a division you've been a, a high caliber athlete in college right at azusa pacific is that yeah right and uh so i'm sure that that you had a lot of goals and this is something that james clear talks about so i i, I love this book atomic habits it's i don't get I don't get paid. I'm not sponsored. This is just something <laughs> that I love. And what he talks about is that everybody that's in the Olympics wants to win a gold medal. Yeah. So the goal, their goal is identical. So it's not about goals at all. It's right. about your process and the system and the daily habits that, that you're trying to do to get to that goal. And the right. people that commit to them and do them more are the ones that ultimately achieve that goal. So like maybe... Is there something like a failure that you've noticed or maybe a success that you've learned from and applied to, to another area? Or, or I'm just kind of interested in that. You know, a like, I, I think so. I, I, I mean, like, I've always had this, like, inherent ability to, like, really, like, just be really tenacious with, like, work and employment. And I definitely have a perfectionism mentality. I'm not, I, I like I said, I am not a perfect person. I know that about myself. Um, and I try and walk the walk the best I can. Um, I think like the most failures come more from my personal life, but I try and learn as much as I can from each thing I go through and then make it applicable to all the other areas of my life. So for me, like I've been through some tough relationships, ones that didn't work out so well. And mm -hmm. I think about like those failures and how I attributed to that relationship failing or, you know, even relationships within my family. And I think about 
you know, the ways that I impacted that and then take that into, you know, another area of my life, which is now, you know, med sales. It's like, okay, if I know that what I did in this situation created this level of failure, it's like, what would I do in this situation that might also create that level of failure? I try and forgive myself as much as I can when I make mistakes. I have like the worst mistake I made as an associate was like, I didn't drop a tray for an ACL case. And yeah. like I, my rep above me was ready for the case. He thought the tray was there. And like, I mean, we can talk about failures like that. We've all been there. It's- oh, we were, I was crying. I was praying like, dear Lord, don't let me lose yeah. this job. Like, yeah. but my boss told me that day, he's like, you know, you're new and you're learning and like, you're going to make mistakes and like, it's okay. As long as you learn from it. And like, I just remember like sitting there, I was, I think I was crying because of his reaction. Right. And I just thought, man, I hope I always have that reaction for myself, but also for other people because everyone's going to fail. So it's like, so did he have a backup tray or was that something where he had to tell the surgeon this isn't oh, happening? This story hurts to share. And like, I hope none of my strikers. Well, <laughs> then, then don't share it. Don't, don't share it. Don't share it. No, it's a good story. It's, I was, it's a good story. I, in this territory in LA, we drove from, I was in Manhattan beach and we drove all the way up to Bakersfield, which was, it's oh, a two yeah, hour yeah. one way drive. Right. So I had three trays and, um, we were doing a swap, you know, it's like drop and then pick up and drop and then pick up. And so my car was just loaded with trays. That was my job for the day. And I was told like, okay, this one facility has a shoulder and a knee. And then this other facility has a knee and you're going to drive to Baker's, but whatever. Well, I end up the, dropping all the trays the next day, the case rolls around and I get a call from my boss. Hey, where's the ACL tray? And I'm like, ACL tray. Well, then I like thinking about it. And I'm like, was it an ACL tray? Like, didn't I drop that? And he's like, there's no ACL tray here. And I'm like, oh my God. I looked in the back of my car and there's an ACL tray in my trunk. I had dropped off one tray and not the other. And he had to pop a competitor's tray yep. for the case, the one that was already there. And he yeah. was, I remember him being like, this hurts my freaking heart, Melanie. This hurts my heart. And like the surgeon did not like this competitor. So right. the surgeon was mad. And I walked in, I ended up going to the case that day and I walked into the room and the surgeon and his PA were standing there and my rep had left, let, let me run the case. And they looked at me and they were, they were like, you know, have you learned a lot? Have you, have you been learning a lot? And what, what's the day, what's your day like? And I was kind of like, yeah, I've had a rough day. My boss had said, don't say anything to him. I told him it was my fault. So in my head, I'm like, he doesn't know that this is my error, that we're using the wrong trick. Right. And he, and anyway, we got on the topic of what makes a good rep, a good rep. And they ended up saying, I can't remember the surgeon, such an asshole. A good rep is someone who's honest with you, who's going to come clean about their failures, who's always going to tell you when they don't know, and never going to let you think that, you know, you've done things right when you haven't. And like, I remember it was so targeted. Like, I was like, does he know? Or like, is this just God, like really hurting my heart right now? It might be God. So we left the surgery and I felt so much guilt, like, cause he thought that my rep had done this and had made this error. And he had just told me that he basically thought a good rep was an honest rep. And I had right. lost, didn't know the truth. So I, I go into the office and he's sitting there doing his dictation. And I'm like, hey, like Dr. So-and-so, I just need to be really honest with you. I probably looked like a four-year-old. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is my fault that you didn't have the right tray today because I didn't drop it. And like, mm-hmm. I don't want my rep to take the blame. And like, I know you said a good rep is an honest rep and I'm trying to be a good rep and I'm so sorry. And he and his PA just start busting up laughing, laughing. like, we knew it was your fault. He told us, we just wanted to make sure you never did it again. But I swear to you that, that experience, that guilt, that trauma, I, I now, you bet I'm double checking every surgery schedule, every tray, like that has not happened again. That was one. Thank you for sharing. That is an amazing story. And you did learn from it. I had... A similar story where I dropped off a tray of iliac bolts, but not the specific set screws for those iliac bolts. I just forgot them. Yeah. So if you know, I don't know if you know about uh, spine surgery, iliac bolts, it's like uh, at the bottom of the construct. And it's typically the last thing that gets spinal tightened. So we do a T2 to the pelvis and all the screws are in, the rods are in, all the set screws are in, which essentially keeps the, the screw, um, the tulip and the rod connected. Oh, no. And then he goes to look for the plugs for the bolts, the little green ones, and they were gone. 
and they weren't there. And they were not only not there, they're at another hospital across town and they were dirty and sick. Oh. I did not get the same treatment that you received. Uh, I was reamed and I was screamed at and I should have been. And yeah. I missed it. I missed that. And I'll never forget it. Uh, and I'll never make that mistake again. And I think that was basically strike two for me. I had done, oh my gosh, this, you're going to die. So the territory that I came from was, was basically a degen. And maybe meaning all this, most of the surgeries were elective and scheduled and we were done around four, you know, three on a good day, something like that. So that kind of had it in that routine. At that time, I was getting there super early because I was the associate and, and then I would work out after, right? This was pre-kids, but um, but I was uh, I, I was with Ashley, we were dating. And um, and then we moved. So 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 I kind of got into that routine, working out at the 4 p.m., 5 p.m. Whenever we got done, we go straight to 24 hour goals, whatever it was. Moved down to Austin, right? And and then it's a different territory. There's a lot of deformity. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of add-ons. There's a big team, a super territory, right? So everyone's kind of all in together. And literally, like the first week, we get done with 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 one of the senior reps that I was shadowing that day. I was I was an associate down in Austin, and I said, "Oh, we're done. Okay, great." I'm like, it, it, "I'm gonna go work out. Like this is perfect. Like I'm in my mind." So again, go to the gym phone in the locker. This is before phones were also your music source. So right. you had like an iPod or whatever it was. I don't know if it was an iPod back then. I might have been a Walkman. I'm old now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I missed like 10 calls. I get back to so get a workout in, get back to the gym locker and open up my phone. And it's just like 10 missed calls from all my teammates looking for me. Basically, they needed my help with some tray turnover between cases and like the rep was in the in the surgery couldn't get to it they needed my help but I wasn't there and again that was like strike that was I think strike one because it was like first week on the job and it was yeah. like you if ever what do you you always have your phone like he goes I go for a jog and this is like the senior rep I go for a jog and I keep that phone in my ziploc bag and he's like I don't care where you are you have your phone and 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 I was like oh my gosh I'm so sorry like don't fire me. I, I, I didn't know that because I, that wasn't how it was yeah. in Dallas. So uh, these are things, these are just kind of these war stories that I think we've all gone through. But the key point is that you learn from them and it's, it's just kind of part of, the, part of the gig, right? On the job training. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, um, do you have any questions for me? I know this is a interesting twist to the podcast episode but i'm new to this mel i don't know if you have questions that you would like to ask me that maybe maybe some other people out there watching would have yeah i mean i think you know i think like i think people are constantly like trying to learn and get better and if you're in this job in this industry you you should be trying to learn and get better because you're never going to know everything um i think for someone that's like a little more new like I said I'm only maybe like a year and a half in which in terms of medical device sales is you're a baby I mean there is so much to learn and and I'm not even in like spine like I would have just imagined like spine I can't even imagine how much you have to know about like the anatomy and the function of the spine I'm in joints and like soft tissue and scope so it's a lot more straightforward but as far as like continued learning goes like I find myself now as a rep like working in the field and trying to get meetings in front of people. And then like also still trying to like study and become like very proficient in speaking clinically about the joint spaces, I guess. Like what was like your study habits? Like when you first started, like, you know, everyone's like, Oh, I'm grinding it out. Like, I think reps have this, this mentality, like when you like don't have cases all day and like, you don't have any trays to drop. And you'll get on the phone at 4 p.m. And I'm like, hey, like, what was your day like, you know, to any of my partners? Oh, I was grinding out. I was here. I was here. I was here. I was here. And I'm like, but were you like, or were you just like on your computer? Because like, you don't, no one does that every day. Right. But I guess like, what do you, what do you yeah. do to time like that? And then what do you do to continue studying and like learning when you first started? Sorry, there's some noise out my window. So we'll, we'll just try to. We're just going to push through. So studies, studies big. I study at night. You know, I'm a big believer in do things during the dark hours that 
you know, that, that you don't want to do during the day. So right now as a dad, I'm very purposefully about how much time I spend uh, editing videos that you see or, 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 or social media stuff. Like I try to do it when they're asleep, right? Where I'll just yeah. get up a little bit earlier, or go to bed a little bit, a little bit later, you know, than, than I'd like, you know, usually here in the office kind of doing some stuff and working. Um, but, but that research in, in all the stuff that you're talking about, like learning your, your anatomy, I'd also spend an equal amount of time on things like atomic habits or sales stuff, because I think that there's a ton of knowledge out there. There's a ton of product knowledge that you absolutely need to learn yeah. and you will learn. Them. But I think an area that is a little bit under uh, focus for, for med sales is, is, is sales training. Just even though we have sales experience, just like everything else, like sharpen the saw, continue to, to improve. Right. Um, and I think midpoint of my career, I took a couple of sales courses that my company was offering and, and, and that really helped kind of just do, just go one step deeper because I was the rep with just three surgeon customers, but they used me for everything the majority of their practice. And that was because I was intentional about how to structure my territory and how to go deeper and how to figure out ways to get as much of their practice as I could. And so I think that, that, that it's just finding the, the being super efficient in your day. So like if there's a surgery, like a spine surgery, there's times of the procedure where an industry sales rep or interoperative consultant, whatever the title is, isn't really needed to be there, like, like present, but you need to be close, either outside the room, in the staff lounge if it's close by, or in some cases I would just stay in the room but yeah. then use my iPad and order surgeries, transfer up trays, kind of be doing a lot of the admin stuff, right? Because when I get home and I had little kids when I was a busy rep, like I just want to spend all my time with my family and leave the phone as close, as far away as I can. But as a rep, it, it, it needed to be uh, within earshot. Um, but I would just say like, be intentional about your schedule. And that's like the best thing that I've learned, like finding pockets in the day to be efficient. So turning over trays, like during turnover of a room, like important, or even during times of that case where if you can get eyes on that room, whether it be a nurse, a circulating nurse or, or, or an associate to say, hey, they're, they're getting ready to put in screws or they're getting ready to do this, then you're there for that. Then right. during the down times of that surgery, you can ebb and flow and do things that you need to do that don't require you to physically be in the room. Right. And so that's where I would say if you're starting out in the industry and, and a lot of people that, that see this probably already know that, but just be super efficient about your time. And, and yeah. the time to study is, is, is when, is when you can really focus and take notes and go, go really, really deep. And for me, that's the dark hours. Yeah. 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 I can see that too. Yeah. Well, Mel, th thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you coming on. If people wanted to follow you or find more information about you, um, where, where, where would they go? Yeah. I mean, I have my Instagram is Melanie N Thomas. So at Melanie N Thomas. And then I have my blog, which is Melly says.com, which everyone calls me Melly. And I'm trying to get like more of my platforms to be Melly, but Melly, Melly, I know. I, I don't know why people didn't call me that in Texas as much. It was like Mel or Melanie. Maybe because I introduced myself like well, more. I'll tell you why, because you would train with us at Orange Theory and it said Mel T. So it was oh, always yeah. Melt. And I was always yes. laughing about it. It was Melt. And so, I know. but maybe that's why. If it was yeah. Melly, it would have been. I know. I should have gone. I should have gone with Melly. Whoever well, did that I, I call, messed up my. As, as, as a token of my appreciation for you coming on to this. Uh, podcast or wannabe podcast let's uh you will be melly and i will introduce you as melly and that's melly says.com melly says.com okay m-e-l-l-i-e-s-a-y-s.com okay you got it thank you so much it's great to to see you virtually uh, i hope that we can see one, one another in person maybe next time you're in austin or next time i'm in san diego yes and, for um, sure yeah we, we, we I, keep, keep crushing it Keep doing things that make make people that know you proud because I see that I see you and and it's great to know that you're out there doing great things and spreading light and you're gonna go far. 
I, 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 I knew from our first breakfast, not trying to <laughs> take any sort of credit for your grit and everything you do, but I just knew that you had it. Yeah. And love to hear, you know, four years later that that it is materializing into uh, a territory at Stryker, which is yeah. a formal company and, and yeah. congratulations and look forward to seeing more of, 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 of what you do. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me be on too. I like, I love all the content and keep you doing bet. it. We'll do it again. We'll, have, yeah. we'll, we'll make a re reoccurring series. Like there you what's go. Nelly doing today? Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. All well, right. take care. Have a great weekend. Talk Thanks. Soon. Bye, Jay. Bye.